On today's PMEA's Take Note podcast, we are talking about chamber music and a chamber music group with roots right here in Pennsylvania. That's on today's PMEA's Take Note podcast presented by the Slippery Rock University Music Department. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Take Note podcast. I'm Mark Despotakis, and I'm very excited to be joined today by Monica Ellis, uh, one of the founders of Amani Wins. What is that? What do they do? We're going to find out all about that today. Um, and, and she's of particular interest to us here in Pennsylvania because she is a Pennsylvanian. She's a Pittsburgher, a product of Pittsburgh Public Schools. Uh, so we are so excited to chat with her today. Monica, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me and asking me to be to be on. Absolutely. So, you know, a fellow Pittsburgher, obviously, we always want to we always want to chat. So uh, uh, folks may have heard of Amani Wins, maybe not uh, fresh off of a performance at the Midwest Clinic. Um, you know, over 20 years, I think you've been around and you're one of the founding members. So um, tell us about the group first. Let's start there. Sure. Sure, sure. Yes, um, it is. It has become my life's work at this point, um, uh, and and I hope to, of course, live many more years. But to date, it uh, truly is one of the most important things I've done. And so, this is our twenty fifth season, in fact. And so, I am one of the founding members. There's two of us within it. It's a it's a wind, woodwind quintet. So the instrumentation is flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, and French horn. And myself as a bassoonist and our oboist are the two founding members that are still with the ensemble. And uh, so in 1997, we formed uh, via the idea of our flutist at the time, Valerie Coleman, who is an incredible composer as well. And she was a great composer back then. And just since then, her trajectory has gone skyrocketed. And um, our French hornist, Jeff Scott, who just left uh, last year, he also uh, is a wonderful compo composer and has contributed to, to the group um, over the years. So, but Valerie had this idea back in 97, we were all either graduating from graduate school or just, just out in the freelance world here in New York City. This concept of a wind quintet made up of musicians of color, African-American and Latino musicians. And if we came together um, playing the standard repertoire, but also exploring other styles of music, other composers, underrepresented composers, uh, what would that sound like? What, what, how would our uh, similar backgrounds um, you know, affect the way the music would be played and our interpretation and our outlook on on music and so she um happened to find you know four other players that that had some like-minded thinking and and um and and i say this i've said this story a whole lot of course over the years and i do i've, I've realized one postscript to the to the idea of of this is just to say that just because you're all black and latino doesn't mean you think the same we're not a monolith you know we don't all have the same upbringings and desires but they're there definitely for us five at least was this similarity of how we just looked at the world and how we approached music and what we wanted to ultimately do. And so uh, we were really able to capture something special. Um, and uh, we came together and, and decided to really work very, very hard and um, uh, have just the performance excellence at the highest plan at the highest level that we could be at the forefront of our mission. And then as time went on, we recognized what we were becoming role models where we were becoming bigger than just ourselves. And so we started things like our chamber music festival, which is now this coming summer will be in its 12th year a, a, a summer event. We started a commissioning project. We call it the legacy commissioning project where we are constantly either commissioning ourselves composers to write for us or others are commissioning composers on our behalf. Um, we just uh, about four years ago started a nonprofit wing to our whole operation. So now we have a foundation where you know, we can get bigger donations and just have, have more support to fund all of these initiatives. So um, it's, 
it's it's been a blast and you know we travel all around the country and all around the world when the world is opened up that right. is and um and we got a grammy nomination this year too for our latest awesome album. So, you know, congratulations yeah thank you. life is good life yeah is very good. now one of the one of the goals uh that 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 i that i've read about is you talk about the importance of performing culturally relevant work um and, and I think, you know, you hit on it when you say, yeah, you're, you're, you all are role models. So individually, of course, you're role models. But I think as an ensemble as well, you are a role model for somebody who's saying, you know, looking to potentially implement uh, a, a, some chamber music, uh, chamber ensembles. Obviously, part of that then goes to the culturally relevant work. Uh, that you're speaking to. Can you talk a little bit about that area and how you focus on making sure that is part of what you're doing? Sure, sure. Yeah, I think, you know, um, if you're going to be a professional musician, it's, it's important, especially these days, to just think more broadly about your output. Um, if you're a part of an orchestra, for instance, and you're kind of somewhat of a cog in the wheel, um, and you might not realize, you might not think you have a lot of say in what um, the programming is or what the what's going to be um, put out there. And, and I think that's just not the case anymore. I mean, there was a time when that was the case. So even if you're in a situation like that as a professional musician, you still have a say and still have a way of, of uh, contributing to what is going to be the um, the, the output, the, the musical statement. And so particularly though, as a chamber music group, we have a lot more autonomy and, and, and control over what we are putting out there. And so for us, it is important to, what we like to say, speak to the times in which we're living and, and have music, play music, perform, create music that does have a relevancy within the world we, we're, we're living here, it, living in here. So, you know, yes, the, 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 the classics are great. Um, uh, I, if I have to play a Brahms symphony every day of the week, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, the, the music is, is gorgeous. It has a place um, in what we're doing as professional musicians, but there's so much more. And uh, going to cultures that we're not familiar with or that we can, uh, that we don't have an awareness of as much, there's so much to learn and so much that, that as musicians within this sort of Western classical category that we can uh, apply to, we can, we can feed off of that and learn from it. And so, yeah, we've definitely attempted to um, open our minds, open our, our you know, sphere of, of what's out there and um, bring music from different cultures to our platform. So some examples are, we uh, collaborated with a Palestinian oud player some years ago, uh, and uh, had him commission. He was commissioned to write for us, and he performed with us. His name is Simone Shaheen, and uh, incredible master, uh, really, at at the oud and at um, uh, uh, Middle Eastern music. And so we did an entire program with him, and he really taught us, you know, microtones and 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 opened our ears up to that that type of music. Um, we've performed with um, Bandonian players from uh, Argentinian culture and, and the, the, the tango and uh, really dove into the, the music of Astor Piazzolla and performed that music quite a bit even to this day. Uh, but so we recognize that if we are going down this road of, of performing music from other cultures, it's our responsibility to to dive in enough so that there's not this feeling of appropriation, you know, that we're just kind of dabbling and saying, oh, now, now we're tango masters. No, not, <laughs> not quite. So there's that aspect of it too, that when you do talk about going to different cultures and performing music that isn't some of, of your own, we, we really try to do it in a respectful way, in a way that is going to uh, enhance our own minds and, and the way we look at, at music, as well as our listeners. We don't ever want any, any sort of disrespect to occur. So, um, so yeah, but the, the world is so big and there's so much music and so many um, different types of incredible people and, and cultures and ethnicities. And so, you know, I think it's a duty to, to bring that to as many audiences as, as you can, if you can. 
you know, a few months ago on this podcast, I talked to Alfred Watkins. He's a retired band director, and he runs this group called the Minority Band Directors National Association. Mm -hmm. And we were kind of talking along these same lines. And I think the the what we came to is it's about the and. So to your point, yeah, we want to do the Brahms stuff, but what else can we do? Right. But now you, you've you kind of taught me the next lesson, and I think this is the next step for band directors or, or any music teacher out there, is, okay, you know, let's really learn about what we're doing, and let's make right. sure that then, you know, because that's good for us just to learn, right? But then that helps us in what we're teaching. And then we are not, you know, doing any type of inappropriate appropriation. Right, uh, right. So right. I just and, think and that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. and sometimes I, I you know, a, a addition to that comment is that don't feel like you have to have a dissertation on <laughs> Palestinian oud music. You know, it's sometimes these, these topics can be a little sensitive, are sensitive and they can be daunting because you say, well, you know, if I, if I don't know this much, then I can't play the music or I can't approach it or, you know, you know, I'm, it's, it's, it's taboo. And, and I don't think that's the case. I think there's, um, there's a good middle ground with you just learning about certain things that, that, isn't going to be maybe a deep dive into it, but that you're just taking the time to be respectful of a culture by learning that much more about it so that when you do incorporate it into your own playing, there's just, you know, one more, two more levels of understanding. Um, uh, we played, for instance, a lot of music by Paquito de Rivera, and he happens to be a great friend of the groups as well. And, um, you know, incredible jazz saxophonist and clarinetist composer and he wrote a piece some years ago now called Idis Tropicalis and it's an incredible um, uh, wind quintet various movements he's Cuban uh, but various music movements represent different cultures so Venezuelan waltz um, the traditional uh, son s-o-n son music from Cuba Afro-Cuban music um, he has this whole movement about um, uh, Dizzy Gillespie, de dedicated to Dizzy Gillespie. So, you know, each movement is actually dedicated to an individual person or culture. So just like a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of Google search, a quick YouTube search, you know, let me listen to some Venezuelan waltzes before I tackle this particular piece that was written for the quintet. Like that is, that's an easy, very attainable, research that one can do that um, that opens your mind like really quickly. So anyway, it's just one little note to say, don't, don't, don't be scared. <laughs> you know, don't, don't feel like you got to do a deep, deep dive, not unless you want to, and then that's even better. Um, but just a, a little bit goes a long way is the real point when it comes to just understanding these different cultures. And, and for the teachers out there, Imani Wins is a great resource too. I mean, go just take a look at, at, at some of you know your programming and and certainly take a listen uh, to, to that programming and that's going to help you uh, in that process. So um, I want to talk a little bit about just chamber music in general because I think the pandemic kind of raised this idea of in schools of okay this this maybe makes a little bit more sense for us to do in a school. For a variety of reasons, have you seen that on your end that there's been this uptick interest in chamber music in the past couple of years? Yeah, I think I would say that. As a matter of fact, yes, absolutely. With it being uh, not possible to have larger ensemble um, interactions, that the the band directors that did it right, and we ended up having quite a few virtual engagements throughout the pandemic. Um, it just you know one or two started, and then it sort of exploded where we almost had to like not <laughs> say yes to certain things we were just on zoom from you know sun up to sundown it felt like for for a time there but the, the 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 band directors the music programs that i feel like did it right were the ones that were having this sort of creative thinking of of smaller groups of chamber ensembles that they could create and and do you know safely even if it was still with the mask of the special mask you had to have for the for the wind instruments etc um but that's a whole lot easier 
with a with a quintet or a quartet, mm -hmm. then yes, the entire band and having to deal with that. So um, I would say there was a, a bit of an uptick um, in experimenting with chamber music as a means to an end. And then hopefully, hopefully that turned into let's let's get this into our programming, you know, once we've got into the vaccines, of course, and and a little bit further out of the pandemic, we're still in it, of course. Um, so that that warms my heart yeah. <laughs> as a chamber music musician that, um, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, as they say, so that uh, if, if kids out there are playing more chamber music and recognizing the importance of it, uh, even if it had to come because of a pandemic, then I'll take it. And you know, we we say uh, at any chance we get when we're work, when we're working with with uh, young band students at I was going to say at the you know school level, but even if it's into college, that um, the best band students are chamber musicians as well. Mm -hmm. The listening that you have to do, just you know, across the across the section listening the. You know where where is my ear going in another section, not just the the flutes that are right here next to me. So um, when you have the the also I should say the the onus of being like okay I'm one on a part I can't right. just hide underneath somebody else's uh, part here and so that responsibility is is so so vital. So if a band kid can can get into some chamber music duos trios whatever it is it's gonna absolutely make you a better musician. And and there is so much there's so much literature out there, uh, you know. Years ago, when I was teaching, I had a woodwind ensemble, and I was blown away. And, yeah. and in in most instances, I I would you know there was some stuff written for a woodwind ensemble, but I was taking uh, you know I, I didn't always have the French horn, so I was kind of right. rewriting parts and 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 you know so maybe we, it, it wasn't just five kids, but my my point is. I was blown away by the amount of literature that was out there. Mm -hmm. It was such really cool stuff that we could then just make work in that little setting that there's no way you could ever make work in a full band or orchestra setting. Right, right. It's true. It's so true. No, it's, it's you know, I think they go hand in hand. I think it's, it's great to just have um, the experience on both sides of it. So a kid can really uh, say, well, I really love that more group setting, larger group setting, you know, in a way, like it should almost be, be a, a required, um, it'd be a required sort of thing to have maybe a, maybe sophomores and juniors or something like, like get a little bit older kid or not. I don't know. I'm thinking it could be the flip. Like let's start with chamber music and then integrate into the larger band. Um, but yeah, it just, again, forces a kid to listen. Cause I think that's yeah. the one, the one issue with band is that You've got you've got some good ones, but you got some you got some apples in there that are a little kind of like folded it in, you know, and and they may like the communal aspect of it, and that's all fine. But to really get the best out of a out of a sound, um, it's a every every component has to be in place, and and so chamber music really kind of pushes the issue. So, and especially yeah. that responsibility piece, you're one on a part. You're on the part. You missed the entrance. There's no somebody sitting next to you that's gonna it's gonna come in. You can't hide, and and then also uh, we say, well, you know, there's no conductor, so then you have to just the the, the rhythmic yeah. aspect. You have to listen, and and uh, in Imani wins. We we've said over the years that we we've got five conductors and no conductor. Yeah. So you know everybody's contributing at at a time, and then sometimes there's one person that is just leading it, and so you have to follow. And then sometimes there's like kind of nobody, and you just have to use your ears. And so it's it uses the senses in a whole other way. Um, so it's it's a great great teaching tool, I think. And you know, I actually think I enjoy watching a chamber group more than I enjoy watching like a full orchestra because there is more of a responsibility, you know, like to your point, there's, there's not a conductor just given the four, right? right. There is, right. you know, however you, however you decide, how are we doing a cutoff or how are we playing off of each other? Um, from a visual perspective, it's just kind of more fascinating to yeah. see how you're interpreting those pieces of the puzzle. Right, right. So true. No, it's, I think you're exactly right. I think people that do enjoy chamber music, I mean, we just came from Phoenix and, and uh, Tulsa, uh, sorry, Tucson, 
and we are going to Tulsa later in the spring <laughs> and we're going to Seattle tomorrow. So, you know, we've got, fortunately people are out there wanting to see chamber music and wanting to enjoy it. And, and we do hear that, that type of comment, you know, rather frequently that, you know, how do you do that? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like what's what's where's what's the magic who's who's behind the screen here um and uh like how do you start like who knows how do you cue and uh or or i saw that you were cueing this one moment and then somebody else did it and, and and yeah it's a lot of work you know don't get me wrong of course sometimes i do kind of wish that especially when we're playing pieces that are more complicated or just intense you know have a lot of issues to them uh uh from a from a putting together a point of view. Sometimes I just wish, can somebody please just conduct? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but that's the passing thought, you know, more so than not, um, it's it's always fun to have to be that person, you know? So the multitasking involved, uh, all of the, all of the things is, it's, uh, it makes, it makes you a better musician. I'm you convinced. know, I, I might even throw out an idea for music teachers watching to say, this is a wonderful, uh, you know, exercise for your students, play a video, go on YouTube and find, you know, find a money wins and, and talk to your students about how are they communicating without right the downbeat. Right, right. And, yeah. and, and identify those things. And then that I think helps, you know, your musical brain think about those things, even when you're in a larger ensemble with somebody with the baton. Right, right. Yeah. And, the, and by the way, this is the kind of stuff we talk about at our chamber music festival, which it's a, it's a 10 day event during the summertime where students, usually college age students are coming to us wanting to kind of hone in on these on these chamber music skills. They are they have a lot of experience in orchestras or in ensembles, larger ensembles with conductors, but they recognize that um, chamber music as a real art form and as a, um, a, a, a skill set, they don't have those skill sets as much. And so um, we talk a lot about literally like how are, what's, what's the four pattern for the bassoon? What does that look like? What does it look like for the flute? And uh, you know, it, cause they're two very different things. The bassoon faces this way. So it look, it's kind of a mirror image. The flute sticks out. So wh what is that thing doing? <laughs> right. And don't even talk about the French horn. Like this, it, right. <laughs> you know, face that way for Pete's sake, it's going the wrong direction. So, you know, what does this cue look like? Uh, and versus a, a downbeat with a baton, which might be, you know, they talk about in the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, here's the downbeat. Duh. <laughs> it's so late. Right, it's, right. Like, duh, like duh, there it is. Like, nobody wants to be first, you know? Right. And, and, <laughs> so it's, um, it, it is fascinating. It's utterly fascinating to see how music is created in so many different, ways you know and without conductors with conductors and um i mean we're doing another we're doing another project with a string quartet with the catalyst string quartet right now uh, so we're playing non-net music and uh with no conductor so we've got you know the four strings on, on one side it's kind of big half moon and then the winds come around the the right hand side and i'm kind of in the middle with the cellist because with the music we're playing we have we pair a lot and we've spent so much time with logistics, like who's going to cue this, who's going to cut this off, and what does your downbeat look like from a, you know, from a violin point of view, and and so it's, um, yeah, it's incredible. You know, your eyes, your ears, you have to use your whole body to figure out these things, and and it's 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 fun. I think you know some people be like, yeah, that does not look like my idea of fun at all. <laughs> You know, and you just made me think of something else there, like I, I, that I hadn't thought of. We're so used to what a concert band or an orchestra staging is, where the violins are, the violas, you know, whatever. And uh, even in a concert band. And so like I, I, I come, you know, very much from the marching band world where we always talk about staging of elements of, of yeah. visual and oral elements. But you just make this point of, boy, there's probably some staging issues that you have to think about even in a five, 10 person small ensemble, right. because right, where, right. where's your bottom? Where, you know, and where is, where should that be placed based on the piece? I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah, 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 it's true. It's true when we're doing these sort of collaborative pieces with the, with the quintet, 
Um, uh, I'm in the middle, so we've got uh, uh, flute, oboe, bassoon, French horn, clarinet. But within even that, there's at least two or two other ways for sure, maybe three that can it can be configured differently. And so um, flute usually is always on the end since since it sticks out that way. Nobody wants the as right. we say the business end in in, <laughs> <laughs> in your ear. But um, yeah, some people like the French horn in the middle because it's the brass instrument. Some like the the uh, oboe in, on the end, and so the two high soprano instruments are on the end. With us, with Imani Wins, all these years, it made sense just the kind of music that we play. Um, I'm just kind of laying down the bass, you know, all the time. And so me as the bassoonist, it's it's been helpful for me to be in the middle. Oboe and flute love like they've you know like to be next to each other because of the pairings that are mm -hmm. often happen. So they really want to get that have that sound together there. But yeah, depending upon the ensemble, um, it can go a different a number of different ways. And I, and that's that's kind of the fun of it too, just exploring uh, what what works for me, what works for us, because um, it could be different for for one group than than another. And th that's I just think that's the the extra fun part about chamber ensembles that it so it's because some people might hear that and be like yeah boy that doesn't sound but i mean there's so many there's so many intricacies intricacies that you can change there that you can't with a hundred piece band right, uh, right. which is so That's cool true. yeah so yeah. let i want to talk about uh you know you're you're a pittsburgher so you went through pittsburgh public schools and and the music program there what what was your scholastic music journey um, well, let's see. Um, started, I, I was, I like to say I was always a band kid. Um, and I started in the third grade, uh, playing the band, playing in the band. Uh, my, my dad was a jazz saxophonist, uh, old timers would may know him. He's passed away years ago, but, um, Clarence Odin was his name. And, uh, so all time Pittsburghers would definitely know Walt Harper, um, pianist Walt Harper and, and, uh, he played with him. My dad, Clarence Odin, played played with with Walt Harper um, and uh, people like, well, you know, not going this far back, but Stanley Turrentine, you know, the, the 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 popular folks, Roger Humphreys, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of legendary drummer of Pittsburgh. He he's my in my slightly my dad's era. So anyway, I come from this. I come from a line of of musicians, um, and uh, the the legend the the. I don't know about legend, but the uh, the myth, <laughs> the family myth is that um, <laughs> is that I I made like a natural embouchure on the clarinet. Just my dad kind of stuck the horn in my face one day, and and you know this just a you know the mm -hmm. natural embouchure occurred, and so um, yeah, I started uh, third grade playing playing clarinet. Ken Marusi was my band teacher back then at uh, Madison Elementary School. Um, just kept going, had, you know, had that, had a, a, a talent for it. And um, I went to Malayans Middle School uh, for my band, was in the band and the jazz band, the jazz band there with um, Arthur Powell. And I do really attribute a lot to him because uh, in the eighth grade, he's the, who introduced me to the bassoon and um, who kind of suggested that I just give this thing a try. I had, did not know what it was. I mm. wasn't, I didn't have a awareness of it because I was playing um, clarinet and saxophone. And so I think he saw that, you know, I had some talent for those other instruments and I needed a challenge. Um, and I want to say that it, either we got the instrument for our school or it was always in the back of the closet anyway. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Probably that one because yeah. <laughs> you know, there's always a a, a, sax, a a bassoon or an oboe sitting back there that that nobody wants to, wants to even tackle. <laughs> so um, he gave it to him. I remember what I do remember taking it home and just my my this big old box, you know, big heavy case. And my parents were just like, mm, okay, sure, you know, because they were always about just trying things and very open minded. Um, and uh, I also studied with. Um, someone named Phil Koval, Philip Koval. And uh, again, Pittsburghers would know Mr. Koval, K-O-V-A-L. Uh, he was a doubler. He was my clarinet and bassoon teacher for a spell. And then he recognized that uh, as I was coming along on the bassoon that um, I kind of was getting good and, and it would behoove me to have another teacher. And so I always looked to that 
as such a special thing because you know he saw he saw potential in me mm -hmm. that would be better served as with someone else uh it's uh, teaching me and so he suggested that i start taking lessons with mark pantsarev of the uh, pittsburgh symphony uh he was the second player in the pittsburgh symphony and so he, and he goes back he was an old timer back then <laughs> so uh, but i just you know it just um that this podcast is for educators really, really just warms me my heart again, yet again, because I was so, um, I benefited so much because of incredible teachers uh, from Pittsburgh, from the area. Uh, and so Mr. Pansarev is who really, really just got it together for me. Um, I would have these epic like two hours lessons and have dinner with his family. And he would say things to me that I didn't even know what he was talking about. <laughs> But I think, you know, what he, he just said things and I, it's as if he knew someday it would make sense to me. You know, he was just planting these little seeds, you know, not, things that weren't even really related to what we were talking about, like this little, you know, technical exercise. And he was like, oh, this reminds me of a Dvorak symphony. And he was like, expound upon that. And I just, I don't, I didn't know what he was talking about. But to this day, I remember the, yeah. the essence of those comments and um and it really really affected me so he was he was a brilliant teacher um and got me ready for college and and he got he he helped me get the first instrument that i had which is the which is the bassoon i still play on to this day wow. um so you know he i didn't know what to do i didn't know what was the right thing to do but uh he said this get get this professional horn now you know let's not even worry about a student instrument because you're good, Monica, and and it will last you. And like I don't even think we even thought about me not playing it. But if if I hadn't, if I did decide to not continue, then um, for the time that I did have it, it would be worth it. Was his concept behind it? And so I thought that was also just a very powerful sure. statement to have. So um, so yeah, you know, then I went to Oberlin. Then I went to Juilliard. Then I went to Manhattan School of Music. <laughs> oh, just those, you know, just right, those right. places. Right, kinda... you, you all might have heard of them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that I was, you know, that's the Pittsburgh years get the most, get the most common. You know, I also wanted to just mention something that I went to um, the governor's school, um, Pennsylvania governor's school, since we're again talking to, to uh, Pennsylvanians here. Um, and that was also a, a great, great experience. I did that my... Um, uh, sophomore, sophomore year, junior year, no, no, more like fresh. I think my freshman year of, of I've, I've lost the time. One of those years, but yeah. anyway, um, that was super fun. That was just you know yet another wonderful summer experience. Um, that I was able to just do a lot of things. It was my freshman year. Uh, fr after my freshman uh, year of high school, that that summer between freshman and sophomore. Um, because I really wasn't so focused on the bassoon yet, as a matter of fact. Um, it was the, the coming years that I would do orchestral festivals up in Chautauqua, New York, mm -hmm. and um, things like that. So, yeah, so there's there's the there's the story. <laughs> and I tell you, the governor's school, something that unfortunately doesn't exist anymore, that we have been advocating for years uh, to find a way to get them reinstated, be it through the state, um, be it through some partnership with the state and universities. Uh, so I did not know that you were an alum. So as we continue this work, I might be calling on you again okay. for some help okay. in that area uh, because hearing stories of, of those who went through it, uh, it's crucial because I, I've never heard anyone have a bad word about their experience in the governor's schools. Right. Oh, uh, amazing. Totally. Man. I have I have friends, thank goodness for Facebook in, in, in this capacity, at least. <laughs> right. Um, we've got a group that like just refound one another hadn't hadn't talked to each other for years and years and years so no there's there's lifelong friends you make just the the fact that it's multidiscipline i think was was so right. powerful because yeah you're around artists dancers um theater people you know so it's it was a uh, an amazing experience yeah i i did not know it wasn't around anymore yeah so yeah well we're we're yeah. gonna get it back at some point in some yeah form. Um, yeah so yeah, well, Monica, I, I really appreciate this chat and kind of just diving in and telling us about all of this stuff. Where can folks find out more about Imani Wins? 
Uh, yes, absolutely. ImaniWins.com. I M A N I W I N D S. ImaniWins.com. Uh, Facebook slash ImaniWins. Twitter, Instagram, or on all the on all the things. Um, and yeah, our website though is is a is a good home is is a good place to start at least just because uh, it shows where we where we are traveling. And uh, of course, the pandemic crushed so many live live musicians and um but we were fortunate to go into the virtual world um quite heavily and so we were able to sustain ourselves enough you know certainly it was it was tough on on us all but um we are now yet again fortunate because many of the concerts that were canceled um were able to be rescheduled and so that's why we're so busy this particular year, this particular season, and even a bit into next season because it's it's uh, we're, we're doing those rescheduled concerts. So, um, you know, you likely will find us in a city near you. <laughs> well, I, so I'm going to I'm going to keep looking for that because when you are in a city near me, I will be there. Uh, I would really love to see you guys in person. Uh, Monica, good luck on your travels. I know you're you're heading out tomorrow. Uh, yes. And thanks yes. for taking some time to chat with us. My pleasure. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for joining us on PMEA's Take Note podcast presented by the Slippery Rock University Music Department. We will see you next time.